Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 68. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very special guest out in the great state of Nevada, Louis Montoya. Louis, what's going on, man? Hey, man. I'm so excited to be here. I'm glad we finally made this happen. Uh, I'm stoked. Ah, Me too. I am so excited. The first time I came across your content, must have been uh, maybe a year ago. I'm not really sure. It was through the BPN community. Um, I heard your name through the grapevine multiple times. Uh, And then most recently, I actually listened to you on a podcast that you did with a good client and friend of mine, Gage Harness. And uh, and really, it's like, I got to get this guy on the podcast. And so took a little bit of planning and scheduling, but here we are. Um, And I'm just grateful for it. So why don't you introduce yourself, man? I don't even know where to start because there's so much we can dig into. Yeah, man. So I have a crazy story, but my name is Luis Montoya. I'm 28 years old. Um, three years ago, uh, about three years ago, my life changed completely in March of 2019. Um, I almost lost my mom to an aortic dissection. And at that time, I was currently 308 pounds, um, severely overweight, obese, very unhealthy, Um, and that moment where I almost lost my mom just sparked a huge change in my entire journey and it kind of led me to where I am today. Um, so I've ran multiple marathons. I'm currently bodybuilding, um, and I'm always looking for the next challenge. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. So like I said, a lot to dive into, but first and foremost, I have to give you a compliment because your content on social media is so crisp. It is. Thank any, you. <laughs> yeah, man. For anybody listening, uh, go go look at at Lewis's stuff because it's just so clean. It's so aesthetically pleasing. And I wanted to ask you, do you have a background in in any of that? So yeah, that's actually a good uh, point. Um, so growing up, I always have been kind of that like artistic guy. Um, and I remember when my parents got me my first like camcorder recorder. I was recording everything, taking pictures of everything. I was that nerdy kid that would take pictures of people at like my track meets um, or I would ask friends if they wanted to do photo shoots. Um, And my photography skills weren't that great back then. But over time, I kind of developed that skill set and I actually did freelance being in college. Um, And that's how I was able to pay some of my college bills was through freelance photography. Um, So I have that background in photography and I also did web or yeah, web design and graphic design in um, middle school in high school. So I kind of have that um, technical background and I'm able to make some really good content with it. Mm. I, I want to pick your brain a little bit before we get into the more serious stuff on the topic of social media, because you and I both put out a good amount of content. Uh, I would like to think that I have a good message. I know for sure that you have a good message and you can see these other creators on the platform. Uh, if we're looking at Instagram in particular, who just gain this traction that Mm. I think can elude others. And that can be discouraging at times when you're putting out content that is really meaningful to you. Um, Do you face any of that on social media where you're a little bit disappointed or discouraged with um, maybe the lack of uh, attention that some important content gets? Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely relate to that. Um, I think for a long time, I was trying to create content that was like everyone else. I was like, okay, this is what's popular. This is what trends. Um, Let's do all this flashy, like workout videos, um, transformations, whatnot. But I wasn't really enjoying what I was creating. 
and I was getting burnt out. So there would be times where I just like stop posting. I was like, I'm not really enjoying this. Um, and then not till recently, I kind of discovered like, I don't really care what people think. Like I want to post the content that I want to post and that I enjoy making. And I want to share a message with people. Like my whole thing on social media is to inspire others and show them that I'm just like some regular guy that changed his life. And if I can change my life, like, so can you. So once that, I made that click in my head, like I've been able to like create content constantly without like be feeling burnt out. So yeah, I think everyone faces that. Yeah. I definitely think it's something that anybody who puts themselves out there in the internet, whether it's on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or wherever, um, that, that anybody can understand. And so it's nice to know that we're not alone out there. With that being said, do you have a single piece of content that's most special to you that lives out on the internet? Um, I think the most special one to me is one of the first TikTok videos I posted. It took a lot of courage to post that TikTok. I was terrified to do it. I didn't have a lot of followers at that time. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to post this out there. Like no one's going to see this. And it ended up getting like over a million views um, and it went viral on TikTok. And that was when I was like, oh my gosh, like I actually have a story to tell and I can inspire so many people. Like thousands and thousands of comments came in through that TikTok. And I realized like I have a, a duty to help others. Like so many people out there are struggling with what I struggle with. And it'd be a disservice if I don't share my knowledge and like my journey to others and inspire them to make a change as well. So that video is kind of what kicked off my whole like social media. Yeah. There's, there's this obligation that I feel, it sounds like you feel to share the journey because we both understand that other people are struggling with similar things. And even if a piece of content reaches one person and it changes that person's day or week or month or year or life, it's worth it. And I think having that perspective of, Hey, this is a responsibility that I carry, um, to make sure that others know that they're not alone, that others feel encouraged and uplifted. Um, it's a special thing, but it also comes with a weight. Um, and it's not easy to show up every single day like that. Um, and I'm sure that you probably feel that as well, I'd imagine. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I definitely, now that I have um, more people that have eyes on me, I think, double think what I post a lot more. And I'm like, okay, does this have a meaning behind it? Am I just posting it to post it? Like, is this going to help others? So now I, I definitely feel a lot more pressure, but it's a good pressure because I want to be able to create content that helps others. And it's not just this content that I'm trying to make to go viral, you know? So I've kind of just dropped the whole like trying to go viral thing and just create content for that I enjoy and I know will help others. Yeah. I, I ran the New York City Marathon a few weeks ago and uh, part of me, part of me wished that I kept my phone out and with me to, um, you know, be able to just capture moments. But another part of me is really happy that I didn't because I was in the moment. And even though it, it really hurt and I was just laser focused on each next step, um, I'm glad that I was there and I'm glad that I wasn't, you know, filming myself or trying to come up with a concept for a video. And I just experienced it to experience it. And on a personal level, I really want to do more of that. And so I've toyed around with the idea of going out and doing something crazy, like running a really long distance and not sharing it and just doing it for me to see what that feels like um, without the world of social media knowing. Uh, because I think that can be a lost art in the day and age that we live in. It's like you do something, you share it. Are you doing it to share it or are you doing it and then sharing it? And I'm making more of a conscious effort to live and then create rather than create um, and live through that creation. So, yeah. Dude, I think that's such a great perspective to have. And I think that's what's so different about like the way I started on social media is when I started losing weight, I had no, like no thought to like post it on social media. So I was documenting a lot of my stuff just for me because I wanted to see the progress I made. Um, so being able to share that now is like a whole different kind of perspective because I was able to like go through that journey and, and find that solitude and not have to share it with others. And now I'm at this place where I'm like, okay, I feel comfortable sharing it and I know it's gonna help others. So yeah, I think it's, it's really good to do stuff just for yourself. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. With that being said, let's get into your story a bit more. I'm going to ask this question and it's a simple one, but what is the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle? So a circumstance in life that you didn't get to choose for yourself. 
Yeah, so I think one of the hardest things that I've had to face and I didn't get to choose is almost losing my mom. Um, that day is what changed and sparked my whole journey. So I just remember that day, like I came over to my mom's house. I wanted to take her out for breakfast. It was a Saturday morning. I was like, hey, mom, I want to catch up. Um, let's go out for breakfast. And so we went out to breakfast. It was a completely normal morning. Um, we did a little bit of shopping, then came back home. And she's like, hey, Louis, I'm, I'm going to lay down on the couch. I'm feeling kind of tired. I'm going to take a nap. I was like, okay, mom, like, it was great seeing you. Um, I'll probably just head home then so you can rest. And I head home. And about like 7 or 8 p.m., I get a phone call from my stepdad. And this is the phone call where I just remember I blacked out. He was like, hey, Louis, I think your mom's having a heart attack. And I, and I remember hearing that and I was, and I remember these exact words. I said, are you joking? Like, it was like, I was like, no, there's no freaking way. Like I was just with her this entire morning hanging out and it, she was completely fine. And so I was just in complete denial. I was like, there's no way. Like, and he's like, yeah, she collapsed. And literally like, he's like, I am rushing her to the hospital right now. Like get there ASAP, call your sister because my older sister lives in Reno. So she's like 45 minutes from the hospital that we needed to be at. Um, so I just remember panicking, like grabbing, putting on clothes to get to the hospital, rushing over to my sister's or my mom's house where my little sister is. And she and her boyfriend at the time were here as well. So we all drove, like sprinted over to the hospital, uh, met my mom in the emergency room. They still had not admitted her into the emergency room. Um, they were under construction. So it was just so chaotic. Like the way everything happened, like my mom beat every single odd. Like it's insane. She'd be every single odd to get to where she's at. And so they finally like got her into a CT scan 20 minutes later. And the guy that was scanning her was like, Oh my God, I know what's happening. Immediately calls like the surgeon on call, the cardiovascular surgeon. And he's like, we have a 47 year old woman um, who just had an aortic dissection. This is never seen like ever, like in less than 1% of the population of the world. Um, like, it's just such a rare thing to occur. And they're like, the fact that your mom made it to the hospital, you guys need to hang on to that hope because the fact that she made it is insane. Like, she should have been dead by now. Um, so she was just hanging on by a thread. And I just remember that being in the hospital where the surgeons are telling us, like, okay, your mom's going into emergency surgery right now. Um, you guys need to tell her everything that's on your mind now because this could be your last moment to ever, you know, be able to talk to your mom again. And I just remember like the, I don't know how to explain that feeling of like it feels like your world is just closing and like crashing and you're and you're in like this kind of fantasy land where you're like this can't be happening like what is going on and you're almost in denial because you don't want to accept the fact that your mom is dying um so I just remember seeing my mom on her you know her bed about to go to surgery she's saying goodbye to all my siblings and myself and that moment changed my entire life like my whole life was put into perspective and I found this new, like, it was almost like a light had just like illuminated my eyes. And I realized like, Oh my God, like life is so short. And this might be the last moment I get to ever talk to my mom again. Um, and that just changed my entire perspective. Like, thankfully my mom went through about a 17, 18 hour surgery and made it out on the other side. But those were some of the darkest times for me. Um, I had to travel for work at that time. Two weeks later, after my mom had been discharged from the hospital, um, I shouldn't have gone, but I did. Um, and I was in another country, China, for two or a month and a half. And every single day that I was in China, I can't tell you like what I went through. It was severe panic attacks every day. Um, I had an immense amount of pressure to perform on my job because I was representing my job on site as like lead engineer and just thinking about my mom at home like how fragile of a state she's in and she's barely recovering like it was some of the darkest moments of my life and that's when I was like okay well I can either let this you know kill me or I can fight and control what I can control and that's where I really had to test my mindset and like see what I was really capable of and made of and that's when I was like okay I can control what I eat and I can control going to get physical exercise every day. And it's like, 
you know, you grow up hearing all this stuff like, oh, eat your vegetables, don't eat fast food, like don't eat the junk food. I had no idea what macronutrients were at that time. And I just did what I had heard all my life. Eat your veggies, don't eat, you know, bad processed foods, cut out all the uh, sweets or whatever. And so I did that. I was always just eating vegetables, like lean proteins. And I started getting 15 minutes of exercise daily. And that's where I started was at the hotel gym of where I was staying for work in another country. <laughs> so I started going to the gym every day, like consistently. And I went from sticking on the elliptical from 15 minutes. And I got so good at the elliptical that I was able to max out that like, like the incline, the speed, everything on the elliptical, at least for an hour. So I got super good at the elliptical. And I dropped like 30 pounds while I was in China, which is a ridiculous amount of weight. I'm sure a lot of it was inflammation and water weight, as you know, but um, it was crazy how much weight I dropped and just how determined I was like, you know, that saying Nick says like, you have a switch in it, flip it and break it. That's exactly what I did. And I didn't know Nick at that time. I was barely about to discover him. Um, but when I discovered Nick Bear and his YouTube channel, I resonated so much with his message. And he had just lost his mom three months before my mom almost died. And that's what connected me to him so deeply in like the whole BPN community. Um, but yeah, that is what helped me stay on track and like stay motivated was being a part of this community that encouraged me to keep going and pushed me to, you know, not give up. And that was just like one of the coolest things to find during such a hard and difficult time for me. Um, but yeah, man, I was able to just grind and build that discipline. And I knew that I was fighting for myself, for my health. And that was the most important thing to me. I never even cared about what I looked like. It was always about getting my health in check and making sure that I set up myself to live a long, healthy life. Um, you know, my mom going through what she did, I could have ended up like her worse, especially at a younger age since I was so obese. Um, so I worked out for about an entire year and a half, almost two years, every single day, including weekends, nonstop. It didn't matter if I walked a mile or whatever. I was always at the gym doing some type of activity. And I ate very like on point, no cheat days for almost two years. Like I can't tell, like people ask me how I did it. And I'm like, you know, my mom kind of was a spark to that, but like being able to feel better and like seeing how my body was changing was enough for me to like say, okay, this is, there's something here. I want to keep going. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, you know, I realized I was like, wow, there is so much power behind, you know, eating nutritious, wholesome food and working out. When you can combine those two, you will become unstoppable and your entire mindset changes. So yeah, that, that is one of the hardest things I had ever been through in my entire life. Man. Oh, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Uh, second, I'm so glad that your mom made it through that. Uh, and three, I, I want to share a quote. I don't know where this is from, so it's not me, but I'm going to read it. It's a little bit on the longer side so bear with me, but it's about the Lotus flower. So the quote goes, the Lotus is the most beautiful flower whose petals opened one by one, but it will only grow in the mud. In order to grow and gain wisdom, first you have to be in the mud, the obstacles of life and its suffering. The mud speaks of the common ground that humans share, no matter what our stations in life. Whether we have it all or we have nothing, we are all faced with the same obstacles, sadness, loss, illness, dying, and death. If we are to strive as human beings to gain more wisdom, more kindness, and more compassion, we must have the intention to grow as the lotus, open each petal one by one. And it sounds like that mud, right, was that that spark, that experience with your mom, that that time in China um, away from family during that that difficult season. And one by one, you started opening these petals and you were like, I like this. And you continued on that path until the whole flower is open. And I don't know if the whole flower is open for you. I don't know what that looks like. I don't think any process is ever entirely complete when it comes to personal development. But as it stands right now, you're still on this journey. And it sounds like you're still loving it each and every day, no matter how hard it might be. Is that accurate to say? 
Yeah, that's absolutely accurate. And I like that analogy of the lotus flowers and the petals. I think we go through journeys where, you know, at times we have different seasons where all our petals have kind of blossomed. And then there are times where you lose some of those petals because you're still trying to like learn about yourself and you're always striving for growth. So you lose some petals, you blossom some new ones. And I think it's just a constant, you know, cycle of blossoming and losing boss or petals. So that's, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we have a lot to learn from nature. Um, there are so many gems and again, this isn't from me, but if you look at nature, there are no straight lines, you know, um, a river winds through rock, a, a tree weaves its way through the forest to reach the sun, um, a flower twists and turns to do the same. Um, there are no straight lines. And I think the same is true for any process we undertake in life. It's, it's never, it's never linear. There are ups and downs and twists and turns, but we have to have that thing that continues to move us towards where we want to be. So I guess the question is, why are you still on this journey? And is there an end goal? And if so, what does it look like? Yeah, I think that's a great point you made. Um, nothing is linearly progressed. Um, even if you look at like weight loss, like I have logged my entire weight loss journey from when I was 308 pounds to, to all the way down to like 180 and then gaining back with bodybuilding. So if you look at a progression of weight loss, it's like you're literally decreasing, um, but you're going up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's the same thing with any type of journey in life. Like you're going to have ups and downs. And as long as you're pushing towards that growth, you will have some type of linear progression, but it's not a perfect linear line. And that's how everything in life is. You're going to have to push yourself towards that direction. And you're, you have to know there's going to be tons of ups and downs on the way there. And you have to just fight through it. And for me, that's why I'm still on that journey because I know like this new lifestyle that I have, it, I have to make it permanent. Like if I want to continue growing and progressing in my own personal development, in my professional development, anything I want to do in life, I have to keep progressing forward. And I know I'm going to have failures, but through those failures is how I'm going to learn to keep progressing and find and seek that growth. So for me, like it's all about the journey and I enjoy that journey of being uncomfortable and pushing myself out of my comfort zone to learn new things, um, experience new things. I'm in this point of life where I'm experiencing a whole new life. I, for so long, I was kind of in this dark cloud of not really enjoying what I was doing. I was depressed. Um, I mean, I was just a very unhappy person. And like now I see life in a whole new light. And I'm just addicted to self-development and growth. So that's why I still do it. I'm just it's like, this is my new lifestyle. It's become my new identity. Like there's no turning back for me. I'm so glad you used the word identity because it would be easy for someone like yourself to say, okay, I'm Lewis and I'm the guy who lost the weight, but that's not who you are. Fitness and health and wellness and personal development is part of who you are. And as a result, you lost the weight, but you aren't just the guy who lost the weight. And that's important. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, when it comes to weight loss, weight gain, when it comes to progress in and outside of the gym, progress isn't linear and measure, measuring certain things can be confusing and misleading at times. Um, there's a great quote by Albert Einstein, where he said, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be Sorry, let me rewind there. Not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And I think that's to say, you know, when you look at the scale, it doesn't tell you the whole story. And this is a whole tangent we can go on, but you know, yeah. <laughs> muscle, muscle weighs something, fat weighs something, water weighs something. Um, there are so many variables that go into weight. And so if the scale is up or down or it's not changing, like it can't just be because of one thing. And we have to give ourselves grace that if we are truly doing the right things in the process, we have to trust that over a longer period of time, we will see the results that we want. Yeah, absolutely. And with bodybuilding now, I really struggled with having to weight or gain the weight again. To me, it was like, oh my gosh, if I gain weight, I'm going to become fat again or obese and unhealthy. Um, but that's why I hired a, a bodybuilding coach so I can have that external kind of person to guide me and I don't have any bias towards myself. Like I have that external person to be like, no, like this is part of the process. You need to gain this weight. 
if you stick to the plan, you will gain that muscle mass with minimal uh, body fat. So like having a coach to me has been a game changer. Um, but yeah, it's, you nailed that. And that's another good point. I mean, it's, it's a Les Brown quote. You can't see the picture when you're in the frame. And sometimes we need that other perspective in our lives, whether that's a family member or a friend or a coach or somebody else who can see things from a different vantage point to help us navigate that process. Because when you're in the frame, you, it's hard to see the picture, but emotions get in the way, right? And you have that past with the weight that probably makes that yep. hard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with that being said, we talked about a hard season of life that ended up sparking an incredible change for you, but what's the hardest thing you've ever done on purpose and why have you done that thing? So, I mean, my whole journey kind of ties together and that whole spark is what led me to find an addiction towards like endurance sports. And that's, you know, Nick Bear definitely inspired me to get back into running and so the hardest thing I chose to do was to get back into running um, and lose all that weight. Um, but I decided to choose like hard goals that would allow me to really push the limits and achieve things that I thought I could never do. Like never in my mind did I think I could even run, you know, five miles. And then when I achieved that, I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I can run 10 miles. And I was like, okay, let's do a half marathon. So like, I just kept pushing myself and like I got addicted to that feeling of knowing that if I put in the work, I can achieve anything in life. And that's when I was like, all right, I'm running a half marathon. And I ran my first half marathon. This was all through the pandemic. So I ran them virtually for myself, not for a medal. Um, and I was just addicted to what the way running helped me like clear my mind, um, gave me so much clarity and I just loved it. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, I want to run my first marathon. <laughs> and I was terrified to run a first marathon. I was like, I struggle so hard to run a half marathon. Like, I don't know how people can do this twice. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided to hire a coach for that. Um, and Jeff Depew, he's also um, an ambassador for BPN. Um, it's just such a great community. Like you have so many resources with all these incredible people. And so like, I use that to my advantage. And I was able to train with Jeff and he whipped me into shape for my first marathon. Um, and that was mentally, I think it was more mentally challenging to train for a marathon than actually running it. Um, I mean, you know, you just went through it. It's so challenging to like get out there and run and know that all every single run that you are running counts towards being able to run 26.2 miles. So running that first marathon was like the biggest challenge I was able to accomplish. And I did it on purpose. Right. <laughs> so I got addicted to that feeling. And then, um, Nick bear decided to have a go on more marathon in like a few months later. And I was like, all right, we're doing another marathon back to back. So I started literally training like marathon training back to back. Um, and I did two marathons in a row. So it just taught me that, wow, mindset can take you anywhere. If you believe in yourself and you stick to a plan and you build those small daily habits, all those small daily habits are going to compound over time and you're going to be able to reach bigger goals, right? So that, that journey of marathon training has taught me so much and I'm addicted to it. And that's why I'm bodybuilding now because I know like never in my mind would I have thought that I could even have like a bicep, right? Like. <laughs> So it's like, I want to prove to myself, like, I can do this and I can be on stage and have the best physique of my life if I stick to the plan. And so now it's like a year, a year and a half long journey of bodybuilding. So I've been building for about eight months now and I'm going all the way up until May next year. So I like to set these goals that are long term and I like to show people that, you know, to reach these type of goals, it takes commitment, it takes consistency and it takes discipline. So that's why I do it on purpose. I really just, I do it for myself, but I also want to inspire others to challenge themselves to do things that they're not comfortable with and know that they can do it if they really set their mind to it. I love all of that. And I would just add that not only do we tend to surprise ourselves when we continue to just put one foot in front of the other, like you said, you did the half marathon and you thought, 
how do people do two of these? And then you did two of those in a short period of time, two full marathons. And, you know, when it's bodybuilding and it comes to body composition, you know, each and every day, I'm sure you're noticing different things about your body and your performance and you're, you're learning as you go, as you expand your limits. And the beautiful part about social media is now other people get to be along for that journey as well. And I think sometimes when, and I'm just speaking for myself, you can tell me if you feel the same, you know, when we share our process with the world and it's behind a screen, yes, people reach out, you know, send messages. You might talk to people on the phone, have Zoom conversations and whatnot, but sometimes it can feel a bit like you're alone in the process, even though you're sharing it with the world until you have that one interaction that just reminds you that you're not that what you're putting out into the world is important and that what you're pursuing is making a difference for people. Do you, do you get those kind of messages? Do you feel that kind of way about what you're doing? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think if I go back to like when I started my journey, I, it became very isolating. Um, I, I kind of went through this phase where I was like, I need to eliminate all distractions because I have this angle and no one's going to stop me. And through that, I had to make sacrifices and kind of prioritize what was really important to me. And those sacrifices, I had to put them on the back burner. Lots of friendships, um, you know, going out with friends or certain trips, um, whatever it was. Like, I knew that I had to set this environment for myself in order to succeed. And I had to eliminate stuff that was going to get in the way of that. So it definitely becomes very isolating when you have these big goals and you're trying to get to, you know, success, I guess. But um, yeah, it's definitely isolating. But through social media, even though I was so alone going through that journey, I was the one showing up daily to put in the work, to work out, to choose what I put into my body, to eat, to recover properly, to really hit sleep um, eight hours a day, like everything, right? So you have to do it for yourself. No one else can do it. But through social media, you can share that journey and you find out that there's this huge community of people who are also that way. And there's other people that find you and are inspired by what you're doing. And to me, that is like the most incredible feeling when I can, when I get messages from people and they tell me that I've inspired them to make a change in their life, I feel like I've made it like that's even if it's just a few people, I'm like, that's the goal for me in life is I want to make an impact on others and help others however I can and share my struggles and let them know that they're not alone. Like, yes, it may feel like you're isolated when you're going to reach these big goals, but you can reach, lean on others, um, you know, and just talk, like tell them where you're at. Like it's, it's okay to feel like you need help, but it, it is isolating for sure. Yeah. One of the reasons I started Project Endure was to create a community of people who were all striving to be better and who wanted to do that together. Because like you said, it can feel a bit lonely at times. So I have two quotes. I believe at various points, I've shared these throughout the podcast, one for sure. But I'm going to start with a quote from Jeff Hayden, who said, everyone says they go the extra mile. Almost no one actually does. Most people who go there think, wait, no one else is here. Why am I doing this? And leave never to return. That's why the extra mile is such a lonely place. That's also why the extra mile is a place filled with opportunities. And the first time I heard that maybe four or five years ago, it automatically became the background on my computer or my screensaver rather. And, uh, and it really resonated. And I felt like a lone wolf. And then I came across this quote from Frederick Nietzsche who said, those who dance are considered insane by those who can't hear the music. And I realized that there were other people in the extra mile. It wasn't just me, but I just hadn't mm -hmm. found those people yet. And that I yeah. wasn't crazy. I was just dancing. Well, some people would disagree and I don't think crazy is a bad thing, but I wasn't crazy. I was just dancing to music that most other people were not dancing to. Uh, and so those two things tied together made me want to go out and find communities like the BPN community and create communities like the Project in their community where people could go and dance to the same music that other people were dancing to as they were entering and enduring the extra mile. Man, that is amazing. Like, 
those quotes, yeah, I can resonate with those quotes so deeply. I mean, community is so important because yeah, when you're going through this, this journey of like challenging yourself to grow as a person and you feel so alone because all these people are like, you're crazy for doing that. Like, that's so excessive. You're obsessed. You hear all of it. Right. And so you start thinking, you're like, all right, maybe they're right. Right. Um, but when you find that group of people who do the same things you do and they challenge themselves in that way, it's so liberating because you're like, wow, I'm not alone in this. And there's others mm -hmm. who can relate to me. And that I encourage everyone to find their community because it really makes a big difference in your success towards your goals. You know what my ideal friend looks like at this stage of life is somebody who's willing to get up at four in the morning on a Saturday, <laughs> uh, run 20 miles with me, maybe go grab coffee and breakfast. We hit a, a leg session, maybe go walk around downtown for a bit, come home, eat an early dinner and then say, all right, have a good night. And uh, I go to bed at 5 PM, 6 PM, 7 PM. Uh, and you know, like it was hard to find that growing up, especially in college. Um, I was definitely different in college and I, I'm curious mm -hmm. for you too. Like, if you look back, did you always have this spark within you that just needed to be ignited or was it something that truly was new for you when it happened? That's a great question. Um, my, my mom and like my family have told me now they're like, we've, you've always been such a determined guy and it shows through like your academics and like your professional development. But they're like, I think you put so much emphasis into that, that you forgot to like push your own like personal development. Um, and so, yeah, I think from my family's perspective, they thought I've always been this determined guy and I've had it in me. Um, so, yeah, I think I have had that determination. I just never knew how to channel it towards myself. Um, and now that I have tapped into that, I know there's so much like untapped potential I have. And that's why I'm like, I just need to keep pushing myself, keep pushing the limits. I want to see what I can do. Um, and yeah, so definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's cool to hear. And what you said about continuing to push limits makes me think that, you know, it's a long game and it needs to be sustainable. And while a lot of the things that people like yourself and like myself do might seem intense to the outside world, like running marathons or pursuing these audacious goals when it comes to fitness, it's yes, it's intense, but it also needs to be sustainable. So it needs to be consistent over a long period of time, which brings me to the concept of endurance. And I'm curious when you hear the word endurance, what comes to mind for you? I mean, now that I've gone through this journey, that definition has changed a lot. If you look at the definition of endurance, it's enduring something difficult or a hard time. Um, and yeah, like you can apply endurance to so many things like endurance can be living, um, enduring something like trauma. Um, it could be enduring a journey like myself going through weight loss. You can choose your endurance, right? It's like you choose what you want to endure. Um, you have the choice to make a change and it's going to be hard and you're going to have to endure a lot, but you can make it out on the other side if you really like set your mind to it. Um, so if you look at the word endurance, it can be applied to so many aspects of life. Um, it can be like you look at endurance sports. Um, a lot of us, you know, we're kind of crazy. We like to choose endurance sports because they're challenging. They're hard. Um, but it's so rewarding to go through that journey and the mud like you were talking about earlier. Um, so if you can learn to endure the journey, I think you will find so much reward out of it. Um, and then you're just going to be able to perform at such a different level than you thought you could ever perform. Yeah, that's really well said. And I would also say I've started to learn how to enjoy the endurance while it's happening. Um, there are these many small transient moments that happen when I'm going through something hard where I feel satisfied, where I feel fulfilled, where I feel proud that I didn't stop half a mile ago and that I kept going. And that feeling of wanting to quit and then not quitting might be one of the best feelings, if not the best feeling that I have created for myself. And I'm curious for you, if you feel those along this bodybuilding journey, because for me, that happens a lot when I'm running, because there's a very tangible, you know, I can stop here or I can take another step. 
But when it comes to a process like bodybuilding, it's a little bit more spaced out. There might be a little bit more wiggle room and it's less defined as like, I took another step or I didn't. So do you experience that fulfillment, that satisfaction in the process of bodybuilding? Oh yeah. I mean, the fulfillment between like marathon training and running versus bodybuilding, it's so different. I think with running, I found more fulfillment in it because of the clarity and then bodybuilding, there's more fulfillment in it with like, it's more physically demanding and challenging as in like, if you want to see the muscle growth, like you really have to stay disciplined in your nutrition and, you know, progressively overload in every single weight that you're lifting. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely find fulfillment in bodybuilding because it pushes me in a different way that running did. Um, it's like, if you really want to see that change physically, you have to put in the work through your nutrition more rigorously than running. Right. It's like, I got away with eating a lot less clean during running, um, where bodybuilding is so regimented. It's like, you have to really stick to the macros that you have if you want to be successful in the sport. Um, but there is wiggle room. Like I, I am training for an entire year and a half. So there have been points where I've taken kind of breaks from it for like a week or two of not like eating on track and just kind of intuitively eating. Um, but I know that when I get down to like a month or two where I'm cutting very seriously, it's going to be very challenging. And I'm kind of experiencing that now. So my coach is challenging me to a mini cut right now. And he's like, I'm pushing you through these next five weeks as if it were your cut during like, like right before your show. He's like, I want, I just want to like get you prepared mentally for that type of cut. So I'm going through that cut right now and it's really hard because of the holidays. Um, so yeah, no, I just, I find so much fulfillment in that challenge. It's like, all right, let's see if I can do this. Right. Like I'm going to have all these external things from like Thanksgiving and Christmas and all this fun stuff like wedding season and all this amazing stuff that's going to tempt me. But can I push through it and like really stay determined to my goals? So I just, I just love the challenge. Like bodybuilding challenges me in so many different ways. It's interesting to think about endurance through two different lenses. Whereas one lens, you are actively striving for something you are pushing, you are stepping, you are lifting weights, running miles, you're doing something. And then the other view is like, you are resisting something. You are not mm -hmm. doing something. And I'm going to speak for me again. I think the resisting something, the not doing something is oftentimes harder than the doing, right? So yeah. if, if it came to, uh, let's just say eating in this scenario, it would be a harder challenge for me to not eat something that I shouldn't rather than to get to the gym and to push myself in a physical capacity. Uh, do you find one or the other is more challenging for you? Yeah, I think for me, um, with running, um, the showing up to run was a lot harder and then the nutrition kind of was easier for me through running, but it's flipped now with bodybuilding where, um, I feel like showing up or like the nutrition hard is part is way harder than showing up to actually go get my workout done. Um, which is so weird because for so long I was like losing weight and eating wholesome foods. So now that I've gone to this point of like where I'm pretty healthy and I know I can like be lenient sometimes. It's like, oh my gosh, now I have to go back to being regimented on what I eat. So it's kind of, it's tough, but um, I know it's going to be worth it when I step on stage next summer. Yeah, I hear you. So what is the date of the show? Um, it's going to be, so I'm doing the summer shredding events in nice. Houston um, and they haven't released the date yet, but it's usually around May. Okay. So it'll be May, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Christian Guzman is somebody who, uh, has inspired me along with Nick, uh, along with a few others. And I think the commonality is just that all of those people were vulnerable enough to share their journeys with the world. And uh, it's been really cool to feel connected to those journeys and to those people. Uh, and I'm really excited for you to step on stage and to follow that process as well. Um, with that being Thank said, you. yeah, of course, man. Uh, we've talked about a lot. So we've talked about you know, the journey that was sparked by um, the scare that your mom had with her health. Uh, we talked about the weight loss. We talked about the running. We talked about the fitness and a whole lot of other stuff. Something might have resonated with somebody listening. I hope it did. The reality is there are so many things people can be going through 
and somebody's listening to this part of the podcast feeling like they haven't been spoken to yet. And so I want to give you a chance to speak directly to the person on the other end of this podcast who's going through a hard season of life. Maybe they chose to be there. Maybe they chose to be in the mud or maybe it chose them and they're there uh, by circumstance and they don't want to be, but they're not sure where to go next. They're not sure what to do. They're not sure how to get out or move forward. And you get a chance to talk to that person in this moment. Uh, what do you say? So I want you to know that right now it may feel like you're going through hell. Um, it may feel like you're clouded in this darkness and there's no way out. But uh, just remember that your mindset is your most powerful tool. And if you stay consistent and you build these small daily habits, they're going to compound over time. And you just have to remind yourself of what your end goal is. Remind yourself of your why. Um, and know that it will be better on the other side. And it may take time. Nothing happens overnight. But when you stay consistent and you really believe in yourself, um, you can do anything you set your mind to. So don't give up. Keep pushing. Find a community that will encourage you to push yourself out of your comfort zone, who's going to support you through these hard times, um, through these hard goals that you have, um, and really lean on them. And don't be afraid to ask for help and reach out. Um, you know, I know when I was going through my journey, I did feel alone a lot of times, but I was able to lean on others and they were able to help me push through a lot of dark times. Um, so I encourage you to just speak up and don't feel like you're alone. Mm. That's all great stuff. And I, I want to share a concept that I read in Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I wrote a blog on the topic and it's been one of the best performing blogs, not because I've pushed it out to people, but because people have found it through the internet. And I think a lot of people are searching for this, but it's something you said, it's a change doesn't happen overnight. And it's the idea that you put an ice cube in a room that's 26 degrees Fahrenheit and your goal is to melt the ice cube and you turn it up to 27 and nothing happens. And you turn it up to 28, nothing happens. 29, 30, 31, 32, still nothing happens and you give up, you walk away. And if you just did it one more time, if you just got that room to 33 degrees, the ice would melt and you put in all that work and you gave up on it too early. And I think that's a really powerful message. It takes time. Don't lose hope. Reach out for help and you're not alone. Uh, anything else to add there, Lewis? That's it, man. Cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, this was really powerful for me and I'm sure it was for the listeners. If people resonated or they want to reach out, connect, follow your journey, where's the best place for people to do that? So my social media handle is the same for TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube shorts. Um, it's at Lewis Montoya. So L-U-U-I-S-M-O-N-T-O-Y-A. Awesome. I will link that down in the description. And I would highly recommend that if you are on the fence, reach out to Lewis, um, send him a message, connect. Uh, you won't regret it. And uh, Lewis, just once again, thank you so much for this conversation and for everything that you're doing on social media and just in real life, because that's important too. And you touch people every single day and uh, it means a lot. So appreciate you, man. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and I hope to see you soon. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.